Hi, morning. Hello. Nice to see so many of you here this morning. Thanks for making the effort to come. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling very hot now. I'm not too sure because whether it's because of the aircon or because of the spirit. Okay? Because all of us are here, we are filled with the spirit and we are also hot singing the praise and worship songs. Okay, but right now, I'll ask you to settle down a little bit uh, as I begin the session on the history of the Jewish people. Now, to be frank, when I first uh, saw this session, I was a bit afraid huh? because it oh, sounds like very long uh, and sounds like a bit boring. So when I started to prepare for the session, the amazing thing is that I realized it's the most exciting session I've ever prepared. Because I'm going to talk about 4,000 years of history in 40 minutes. 4,000 years of history in 40 minutes. Huh? So that means uh, it's going to be very challenging. So I will ask you to be uh, quiet and listen attentively. <clears throat> the history of the Jewish people may sound a bit boring, but actually it's filled with a lot of exciting stories about heroes, villains, miracles, special powers. Huh? So later on, I'll share a little bit more. But let's ask ourselves this question. Why do we learn about the Jewish people? Can anyone answer me? Why do we care about the Jewish people? Why do we learn about the Jewish people? Yes? Why do we want to learn about the Jewish people? Okay, good answer. <laughs> okay, there's only one reason why we want to learn about Jewish people. One reason. Simply because... Jesus is Jewish. Well done. That's the answer. Because Jesus is a Jew. That's why we want to learn about the Jewish people. If not, we cannot understand Jesus. We cannot understand His parables. We cannot understand the concept of the Messiah. We cannot understand the importance of the temple. You cannot understand the Ten Commandments. So all these things are Jewish culture. So we need to understand so that when you read Bible, you will understand why Jesus says certain things. Now sometimes Jesus says certain things that are a bit uh, not so logical. Huh? Uh, if your right hand causes you to sin, you cut it away. Oh, that was scary, right? Your, left, your eyes cause you to sin, watch it out. Definitely not true, right? So we have to understand the Jewish council, why Jesus said that. Huh? It's not true. If it's true, then today all the Jews are all heavy cats. <laughs> I don't know arm, no, no, no eye, but they are not. So obviously there's something, there, there, there's something uh, missing here. So we want to understand through the Jewish culture. Now I'm going to start the session with this picture here. Do you know what it is? Snail. Now this picture is very important. You know why? Because it helps us to understand why God, why God created the Jewish people. Why God needs to select a special group of people, call them Jews, and then from there comes Jesus. Why did God choose one people from the Jews? He could have chosen anybody. The British. Spanish, the French, the Chinese. I choose the Jews. The Jews. Why? Best question. Now the answer is here. Huh? Can you see the answer? Okay, let me tell you this story. Very short. Uh, two minutes. I'll finish this story. Whenever it rains, uh, you know, whenever it rains, after it rains, stop raining. You see snails moving on the pathway, right? Oh, very strange. Uh. After rain, don't know why they must move on the pathway. And then when they move on the pathway, what happened to them? You accidentally step on them and they die. Once the shell is broken, they die. It's very sad. So for me, every time I see snails walking past, I will put them up and put them to safety. Okay? But the problem is this: if you try to pick up a snail while he's walking, you realize that he refused to be picked up. He just stays stuck onto the floor. Just refused to let you pick him up. Why? Because he thought you were harming him. He, he thought that ah, oh, I'm walking to the other side for safety. You Pump me up for what? So he, he hang on to his life to the ground, not knowing that if I don't pump it up, he will die. He didn't know that. I can't tell the snail that, right? Because I don't know snail language. You know snail language? You know what? You know? If, if I could tell the snail, snail, if you walk this path, you're gonna die. So please, 
Let me pick you up and put it on the other side. Show him the side. Use the use the hammer. Okay. Okay. So so the thing is this: God is like us humans, and we humans are like a snail. Why? Because we cannot understand the ways of God. God wants to remove us from a dangerous position to safety, but we cannot understand God because we do not know the language of God. So God has to appear as a snail. Snail to snail talk, huh? Snail to snail talk. Big snail. Danger. Don't walk there. It has. It takes a snail to talk to a snail, right? And if I suddenly become a snail and I tell you, uh, Daddy Snail, I am Jesus, the Savior Snail. Let go and let God pick you up. He will be shocked, right? The snail will be shocked. Whoa! How come suddenly got Jesus snail here? Oh. Incarnate of a human. So what God did was this very amazing. He knows that humans are, if they suddenly see God, <gasps> well, they'll be shocked. So he planned for 2,000 years. He started with one guy, Abraham, the master snail, the bigger snail. He started with Abraham. And for 2,000 years, he prepared the snails for the coming of Jesus, the snail. Right? So that is why he needs to choose the Jewish people. He needs to choose a bunch of snails. So he just, okay, now I choose this bunch of snails. I call them the chosen snails. The chosen snails. So that the chosen snails will tell other snails in other countries, other nations that the Jesus snail is coming. Listen to him. Listen to him and you will find a safe path to the other side. Okay? So that's why we need to learn about the Jewish people. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Okay. So this is an overview of uh, my session. Divided into three parts. First, I'll talk about the patriarchs. Patriarchs means the head of a family or a tribe. The, the main patriarchs, kings. Oh, this is my favorite book. Kings. Uh, prophet. Also, I like prophet. A lot of magic, a lot of uh, special powers. Huh? And then we come to period of Jesus. And I'll talk about the temple and the diaspora. you understand what it means later on. The last part I'll talk about now, current affairs. What happened in this century? The Holocaust and the establishment of the state of Israel. So very, very long story. I'm very excited. I'm starting with the patriarchs. I'll spend a bit more time here. Lesser time here and much less time. Okay, because this part is very important. Okay, let's begin now. Who is the first patriarch? Who is this? Abraham, right? And who is this poor boy? Yeah, what's his name? Huh? I said, yes, what's happening here? Why is Abraham so crazy? He wants to kill his son. God asked him to do it. Actually, God asked him to do this uh, is a bit illogical. You know why? Because God promised Abraham, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in heaven. Have you ever found the stars? A lot, right? Scientists say they are billions and billions and billions and they're still counting today, they're still counting. <laughs> okay, so God says that Abraham, you're going to have lots of descendants, but this is your only son and among you to kill him. <laughs> Not much good, right? But Abraham, being Abraham, the father of faith, he fully trusted God to do the illogical. And he, when he was about to kill his son, what happened? An angel of God appeared and said, Abraham, do not kill your son. No, because God knows now that you have faith in him. Your faith is really uh, uh, pure and 100% unconditional. So we, that's why Abraham is known as the father of him. Now, later on, a lamb suddenly appeared from nowhere and uh, he sacrificed the lamb instead. Now you understand where the phrase, the lamb of God, comes from. Right? Lambs, unfortunate animals. Usually they're sacrificed in the temple. Poor thing. <laughs> so lambs are usually sacrificed. That's why we call Jesus the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. So in this case, a lamb took his place. Now let's move on to another very important patron. Who is this guy here? Not x men no. Moses. How do you know Moses, huh? Look at this. Whoa, the splitting of the Red Sea. Now Moses is one of the, the greatest patriarch 
of all in the Jewish history. Why? Because he performed super miracles like this. Huh? But there's one lesson you can learn from here. Okay, this is what I need to understand. After he did this and many more miracles, what happened to the Jews when they were in the desert? Like good Singaporeans, they complain. Right? The Jews who saw all these fantastic miracles still complain. So today as Christians, if you keep asking God, God, show me miracles and I will be satisfied. I'll be a good Christian. Confirm my Show me just one miracle, I'm happy already. But during my time, it's like that. You always hear miracles far, far away, but never in Singapore, whatever, whatever. You hear about Lourdes, Fatima. Singapore don't have, so you keep asking God, please give me miracles. No need to travel to Europe to see. But, but the problem is this. The Jews, having seen, have, having seen this miracle, also complain. So that means what? That means that miracles are not necessary for faith. Okay, what, what you believe is not really... Uh, miracles are not really needed. So do, no need to ask for miracles. If you have bonus, uh, good uh, uh, if Singapore got a miracle, we happy also. Uh, but most probably you will not happen. Uh, uh, so miracles are not necessary. Okay, the, the key leader here, Moses, uh, started this feast day called the Passover. Uh, you remember the Passover? The Passover feast commemorates the time when the angel of death passed over the Jews. They killed the firstborn. Remember the story? That's how uh, they escaped from the Jews. So every year, the Jews have to go to Jerusalem for the Feast of the Passover, which is what Jesus did, remember? He went to the Feast of the Passover, he had his last supper. The last supper. He had to have a meal uh, before the Passover. And that's why Jesus instituted the Eucharist uh, during the last supper. Because the last supper is a very important meal by the Jews because of the Passover. Okay? Okay, next, after Moses, after Moses and he was dead, there needs to be somebody else to take his place. And during the Jewish history, there's one guy. In fact, this guy is the strongest guy in the Bible. Who is he? Strongest. Stronger than Hercules. Yeah. Samson. Samson. Well done. So this guy is Samson. Samson. Huh? He's one of the judges of Israel. When we call judges are actually people like uh, Moses, they judge the people and they fight against the enemies of God. So here is uh, Samson. What he did here was that he destroyed the stadium where a lot of Philistines, their arch, enemy, their arch enemies, uh, there are 3,000 Philistines in this temple in uh, Israel. And then Samson, using his strength, he destroyed the two pillars and in that day alone he killed 3,000 Philistines. Uh, so very strong, very powerful. Now, I give it to you to make the story of Samson. It is a very, very interesting story because he has infinite strength. Huh? He can kill lions, he can do a lot of things. There was once he killed an army of 1,000 Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. Just one jawbone to kill 1,000. Whoa. But he has one weakness, and this is something that uh, guys, he has one weakness that we guys must learn about, guys. He has a weakness for women. Uh, he has weakness for women. Yeah. In fact, throughout the, the heroes of the Bible, you realize that ah, somehow women uh, usually cause the downfall of great men. And Samson is one of them. Uh, he lost his strength because of his love of a Canaanite woman. Very sad, very sad. So guys, beware, beware. Uh, so remember Adam and Eve. Uh, you know who caused Adam. So, so same thing here. Uh, in this case, it's Delilah who caused him to lose his strength and then he was captured by by uh, the Philistines. Very interesting story. Go and read it, huh? Okay, next speaker. This one? Can you guess who is this guy? Uh, 
you charge her, you know, you charge her. Then you say, you, you, you charge her, you charge her, you charge her. So in the end, nothing happened. So then the Peter's son commander said, okay, don't stop this time. Let's send one guy, the strongest guy you have in your army. And whoever defeated this guy uh, will win the other armies and the rest will be slaves. So they sent who? Goliath. Whoa, Goliath. Do you know how tall is Goliath? Yeah, how tall? How tall is Goliath? Do, do you know the basketball player Yao Ming? Basketball player Yao Ming. Yao Ming? Yao Ming is 2.2 meters. Oh. Goliath? Somebody mentioned before. He's between 2.5 to 3 meters. Whoa, Goliath. So the life is very scary, and as he spears, his javelin, oh, very scary guy. And this is young King David. At this time when he was fighting the lion, he's probably you know, 17 years old, 18 years old. Slightly older than you only, huh? And he killed this the lion. So he killed him with a stone, remember, with a sling. Okay? So he did it not only not because he had good aim and he killed the lion, it's because he has faith in God. He's fighting using his faith in God. So it's his faith that killed the lion, not the stone. His faith killed the lion. Now David is one of the most interesting characters and I studied him in great detail. I read the entire book about him. Now he is the only person in the Bible who the Bible described as a man after God's heart. Okay, you Google the research. Cannot find another character where the Bible writes a man after God's heart. Wow, amazing. Not even John the Baptist. Huh? Not even Elijah. Not even Isaiah. But King David, he was a man after God's heart. Meaning that he really truly loves God. That is why he composed the majority of the Psalms. Remember the Psalms? We have 150 Psalms. Majority of that composed by King David. Out of his love for God. Why do we sing praise and message? That's all. Because singing is part of the Jewish custom. They learn to sing to God. And David is a good composer. Right? He composed a lot of songs and he played instruments. Oh, a very talented guy. Not only can he write giant, he composed songs. So, uh, so he composed all, nearly all the psalms. That's what we sing. And as the great Saint Augustine, one of the doctors of the church, said, when you sing, you pray twice. Okay? Here this again. When you sing, you pray twice. This is not I say what I say. Saint Augustine, doctor of the church. That is why we sing. So later on when we sing, you're actually praying twice. Wow! So, half the effort, huh? So later on, we sing with your heart. Okay? Because you're praying twice. Okay, and one witness of King David, again, what women, okay? Cause his downfall. So even though he's a man after God's heart, he was vulnerable to lust. Uh, vulnerable to lust and pride. Uh, so he committed sin. In fact, like he alone breaks he broke most of the commandments of God. You know, but then right, he broke a lot already. I think three or four of the major ones, very terrible. Right, so, so imagine a, a person who is up, a man after God's heart can do such terrible things. Let alone us. Let alone us. That is why we need the sacraments to strengthen us in our journey of faith. Okay? Just because you learn God, yeah, yeah, learn God's same place and worship very happy means that you, you, will, not us, you will not commit sin. Built the first temple, um, he built the first temple. He, he brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. He did so many fantastic things for God, but yet he sinned greatly, breaking three or four commandments of God. Because he's not careful. So we need to be careful in our faith. We need to frequent the sacraments to strengthen our faith, but our faith and defend ourselves against sins. Huh? Okay, let's move to another great king. Now, this is another one with a very exciting story. You know which, which king is this? Well, Solomon, how do you know? Huh? What's it Solomon? Say Solomon. Uh, how do you know this is Solomon? Uh? How do you guess? Uh? Wow, look at his face. He's king after David. Wow, very smart. Uh? Okay, actually a clue, uh, a clue in this picture. Uh, it's not the king. Uh, because we don't know how Solomon looks like, right? The baby. Why? Why? Okay, 
Good, so I tell you the story. I promise you do not Now, these two ladies are actually <sighs> prostitutes. Okay? They are prostitutes. They stay in the same house and they happen to give birth to a baby at the same time. Okay? They also don't know who's the father. They don't care. Okay? So, they stay in the same house, they give birth to a baby. So, they are two babies. The one night, one baby died. And the next morning, he woke up and realized, oh no, the baby's died. Whoa, they're very sad. Then the other lady said, hey, hey this is my baby. Lah. The, the one that is dead lah, is lost. They said, no. No, this is mine. No, but this is mine. This is mine. So they argue, argue, and they say, never mind, let's go to the king. Let's go to King Solomon. It's very wise, right? So ask him to solve our uh, problem. So they went to the king. No, today, yeah, today you use DNA test already. Huh? Right, today DNA. No need Solomon. Uh, but at that time, no DNA. Huh? <laughs> so they have to go to King Solomon. And the babies are you know, so cute, so nice, right? They look exactly the same. So which one is which one? Like, uh, does it look like you? No, no, the nose, okay, your eyes, no. So they can't tell. So they went to King Solomon. And Solomon said, oh. So look, all the Jews were looking at Solomon. Wow. He has. Wisdom from God, because God appeared in a dream to him, asking him, Solomon, what do you want from me? So Solomon asked for wisdom. And then God gave him wisdom that surpasses all men in all history. Even to today, nobody is as wise as King Solomon. So he has this wisdom. So these two ladies know that Solomon should have a solution. And what was his solution? Very ingenious. Okay, right now, you take one minute to think about how to solve this problem. Without the use of DNA and uh, testing. Uh, how to solve this problem. Uh, how to solve one? Uh, Hey, hands up, uh, because we are uh, fast forward. Okay, uh, somebody has an answer. How was the problem solved? When you're so shy, uh. okay, okay, I tell the story uh, because not much time left. So King Solomon said this. King Solomon said this. Okay, ladies, ladies, very simple. Each of you claim that this baby is yours. Very simple. Let's cut it into half. Each of you take half. Lah. Very fair, uh, unfair. It's fair, uh, good solution. No. It's not. Uh. Actually, it's a very wise solution. You know immediately what happened after this? The real mother said, King, let the other lady have the baby. I don't want you to kill that lady. Have the and the other lady, ah, it's fair. Uh, it's not the mother. It's fair. Uh, let's have the other. Because the lady is not the real mother. So the real mother said, give it to her. And then King Solomon said, there you go. That is the real mother. That is the fake mother. Brilliant, right? That's the fake mother. It won't be kept for me, I don't need a <laughs> So brilliant solution, right? So simple, but only if somebody who's wise can know. But Solomon, he has another problem. You know what's his problem? Same thing, good man. It did, huh? You, you know how many wives he has? You cannot believe these guys are going to please. Don't, uh, please don't try this at home. Okay, no. He has, he has 700 wives. Hey, that's not all. Excuse me, that's not all. He has 300 concubines. So add together for 1,000. Three years, every year, they have a different woman every day. Okay? So crazy, right? Like. That's not the worst thing. After he had this 1,000 women with him, his heart turned to their gods. And he started to worship other gods. Okay? He broke the first three commandments of God, the most important one. He worshiped idols. So even though he's so wise, so wise, and solved this problem, he still committed sin. Huh? And, and it led to the downfall of the kingdom. After him, the kingdom of Israel went into disarray. A lot of problems. It led to the divided kingdom. Israel is now no more one kingdom but two kingdoms. This is very important. Okay? Focus on this map here. The kingdom broke into two. One called Israel with Samaria as the capital. And the other one called Judah with Jerusalem as the capital. Remember the parable of the Good Samaritan. Remember that? Good Samaritan. Why did Je the people in Jesus' time dislike Samaritans? They are like enemies. Because of this, because the kingdom broke off, 10 tribes of the Jews, remember Jews got 12 tribes, right? 10 tribes left and formed Israel, leaving two tribes, the tribe of Judah and Benjamin in, in Judah. But where is the temple of God? 
Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So Judah, to the Jews in Judah, they are the real chosen one because they still worship God in the temple in Jerusalem. By the way, Solomon built the first temple of the Jews. The very first temple of the Jews was built by King Solomon. It's one of the greatest structures, one of the greatest structures in the history of mankind. It's a huge structure. Now, that is in Jerusalem. So the Jews in Judah look down on the Jews in Israel, whose capital is in Samaria. Because they are, you don't worship in the wrong mountain, the huh? wrong place. We all worship in Jerusalem. Huh? So they call them the Gentiles. Huh? They always refer them, ah, you are the Gentiles. Okay. So as you know what happens when the kingdom is divided. When the kingdom is divided, it weakens. And hence, other enemies can conquer it easily. Which is what happened. And these people here, both kingdoms, both are not emphasized of both kingdoms, turn to idols. Idols. They worship other gods. Because of influence of women from other nations around them. Huh? The Ammonites, the Moabites, the Edomites, the Syrians, the Phoenicians. They were influenced by other nations. And hence, they worship idols, they were divided, and hence, it led to the kingdom being weakened and attacked by enemies from all sides. And hence, God decided to send prophets to try to turn their hearts back to God. And then send this most powerful prophet of all. Guess who he is? Can you guess by this picture, you know which prophet is this? The most famous one, huh? Huh? Hey, you said the correct one. Elijah, yes! Whoa, Elijah! Remember! At the Transfiguration, who was there with Jesus? Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah. Ah. So you need to know about this prophet Elijah. Why is he so famous? One of the reasons is because of this battle here. This is another story. I'll take five minutes to tell the story. Now, Elijah challenged the Baals. Baals are another foreign god. So he was challenging 450 Baal prophets at a time. One person against 450. He said that your God is fake. Mine is true God of Israel. God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. Okay? So, he challenged them. This challenge is less than God. They each cut a bull, they choose a bull, they cut it out, and put on, on some uh, sticks. So that uh, they say, if your God is true, ask your God to set fire down and burn the bull. Okay? So Elijah said, ah, you, you've got 450 of you, I let you go first. Huh? I give chance, I let you go first. So the 450 Baal prophets, they pray, they pray, they sing, they do all sorts of funny things, and nothing happened. And then Elijah, said one of the funniest things in the Bible. Okay, you read this chapter, it's in the Kings. Uh, he said this thing very funny. Hey, Baal, Baal prophets, uh, maybe your God, no, siesta, sleeping, you know. Pray louder, uh. He really said that, you know. He said, pray louder, pray louder. So they pray louder. Hey, maybe your God, your God uh, is on vacation somewhere else, uh. you, you must pray louder so you come back and say, he's, he's actually sarcastic and uh, joking with them. Hey, your God really will, right? How come he now answer you? So he really taught them until they die. So because they become Baal prophets, they think they cut themselves, they cut themselves, God will listen to them. So they cut themselves, they do all sorts of funny things, nothing happened. Then Elijah said, My turn. My turn. And now he, he quite yaya, you know, you know why he quite yaya, he quite proud. Uh, he said, I make my task more difficult. Can you take four jars of water, pour over the wood and the uh, pool? You need so difficult to burn away. He pour water somehow. Like, oh, I said, then why pour water? He pour water over the pool and uh, the, the, the logs. Difficult to burn. So he poured to the whole place was filled with water, even surrounding it. And then now he prays to his God. He said, God, listen to me and consume this food. Boom, fire came down from heaven, totally burning. Totally, absolutely burning. And at the time, he killed all 450 Baal prophets during this time. Okay, so very, very exciting. Okay, so Elijah, and nothing special about Elijah is that he did die, okay? He was brought up to heaven in a chariot of fire. So, chariot of fire, very strange, right? But he is one of the few, in fact, one of the two characters in the Bible which did not die. The other one is to not. Huh? That's another story. He went up to heaven straight. That's why when the Jews heard the transfiguration, they go, wow, Elijah has come back. Because he never died, huh? so he come back with Moses. Okay, that's why it's so special. Yeah. How about Mary? Yes, we learned about the lesson in Assumption, right? Mary was assuming to heaven, but nobody saw it. Nobody saw it. But his disciples saw him being... In fact, Elisha, his successor, saw him being taken up to heaven by chariots. 
And the reason why Elijah is so important is that he's very similar to Jesus. He could do miracles like raising the dead. He could raise the dead. He can multiply food, learn multiplication of loaves that Jesus did. He also can do what? Ah. So when, when the Jews saw Jesus did multiply of loaves, they say, Oh, Elijah. That is why when Jesus asked the question, Who do you say I am? Some of the Jews say, You are Elijah. Because you're doing what Elijah did before. And do you know that Elijah also spent 40 days in the desert, similar to Jesus. So there are a lot of parallels between Elijah and Jesus. Huh? You have to read about it. But let's move on to the next character. Now, this is another important prophet, prophet Isaiah. Now, it is Isaiah. From him onwards, the prophesied the coming of the Messiah. Okay? Because the kingdom was in disarray, he came and told people, do not lose hope. Someone is coming along the line of King David who will save his people. And that is the Messiah. So Isaiah prophesied about the Messiah. This is what he wrote. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a child, and his name will, and, and, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Uh, that's the name of Jesus. Emmanuel means God with us. So he prophesied about coming to the Messiah. Now, a very big question for all of you now. If the Jews are expecting the Messiah, why did they not recognize Jesus when he arrived? Because he looks like a normal child. Very good answer. To the Jews, the Messiah is like King David. Wow! Got big army, got big horse. Red horse, no, 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 no. Huge armies following him. To them, the Messiah is a human figure like King David. Never in Jewish culture would they think that the Messiah is God Himself. Okay? So when Jesus came and said that I am the Son of God, they shouted what? Blasphemy. Blasphemy. And you are to be sentenced to death. That is why the Jews never believed in Jesus because Jesus not only claimed to be the Messiah, He claimed to be God. And to the Jews, and no. Messiah is a human being, like King David. Cannot be God. That's why they didn't believe God. But they did not understand scripture. Huh? That is another lesson which we will we'll tackle on in the class. Why? Or what, how to interpret uh, the passage of Isaiah, Isaiah to know that Jesus is the one. Okay, and then because the Jews were divided, eventually the temple was destroyed in the year 586 BC. Okay, this is the destruction of the first temple by the Babylonians. Because the kingdom was weakened, the Babylonians came and destroyed the first temple. Very sad. Very, very sad. And the Jews from then onwards were dispersed. They were exiled into many, many countries. And then at some point in time, the Romans came out and took power and they conquered Jerusalem. Well, these are the Romans. And now we move on <coughs> to the time of Jesus. And what happened to the second temple and the diaspora? Okay, let's look at this uh, scene for a moment. So all that has happened in Jewish history led to this moment in time where Jesus came and died on the cross for all of us to save all of us. And as we have read in the Bible, Many of the Jews did not believe him. In fact, they were the ones who crucified, crucified him. So now you know roughly some of the reasons why they did that. And after Jesus was crucified, <clears throat> the Jews were very restless and they revolted against the Romans, resulting in the second temple being destroyed by fire. Now, to the Jews, the temple is a place of worship. It's where God resides. So when the temple is destroyed, they were lost. And up to today, today, if you visit Jerusalem, there's no temple. There wasn't a third temple that was built. The first was built by Solomon, the second after that. When the second was destroyed in 70 AD, wow, close to 2,000 years ago, they never built a third temple. Do you know why? They scared the other people's neighbor against. Actually, they did not build a third temple for a very practical reason. During the rise of Islam, Muslims conquered Jerusalem. 
And when Muslims conquer a place, uh, they will build a mosque in place of the previous uh, worship area. So when they destroyed, when, when they reached Jerusalem, they built two mosques in place of the temple. And today the two mosques are still there. And nobody dares to destroy those two mosques and build a better temple, right? No more tree will happen. <laughs> so the Jews in Jerusalem, oh, they see the two mosques there, they cannot do anything. Okay? Because World War III definitely will come. So the Jews today, today, they are praying for the third temple to be built. And that is the time of the Messiah. They are still waiting for the Messiah, okay, the Jews today. They are waiting for the, third, the Messiah to come and build the third temple so that they want people again and worshiping God in Jerusalem. Now, I want to share with you a bit more about the diaspora. Now, since the Jews were captured by the Romans and then they revolted, they were spread all over the world. And today, this data, by the way, is in 2010. So today, 2017. Today, there should be about 16 million Jews worldwide. 16 million Jews worldwide. They spread all over the world. But mainly in Israel, you know, there are about 6 million of them. So, they are in Singapore. What's Singapore? 5 million. 6 million. Very small people are making a big impact on the world. So, they are mainly in Israel and the United States. The United States, they have about 5 million. And they spread all over the world. Because they do not have a home, a permanent home. Until, until the year 1948, when the state of Israel was established. But right now, I want to move on to the current affairs. I want to talk about the Holocaust and the state of Israel. Now, before we talk about the Holocaust, I want you to understand why today in the world, many people hated the Jews. Okay? And here are some of the reasons why they hated the Jews. First reason, simple. They were responsible for the death of Christ. Not that Christians hate them, or we don't hate the Jews, no. Because without them killing Jesus, then there wouldn't be salvation, right? <laughs> Jesus had to die. It's part of God's plan. So we cannot hold the Jews responsible. It's part of God's plan. S other reasons is that the Jews deny Prophet Muhammad's prophet, uh, prophethood. They say Prophet Muhammad, no, not real. So they're hated for that. That's why the Muslims uh, destroyed uh, Jerusalem and conquered it. In the 5th century, they were seen as greedy, People, they started epidemics. All these are fake all these are misunderstandings, this complication. But they are blamed for it. And Jews are also blamed for uh, Nazi ideology and the Holocaust. Even though they were the victims, no? but they were blamed for it. Okay? And then from 1948 onwards, they have the state of Israel and they were blamed for chasing out the Palestinians. They are seen as bullies. Uh, why bully the Palestinians who were there for so many years? Kick them out and form the state of Israel. And today, in the 20th and 21st century, a lot of people think that the Jews actually run the world. They, 16 million only, how can they run the world? We have 7.4 billion people in the world, and they are just 16 million. Why? It's just a misunderstanding. Because some of the most powerful people today in the world are Jews. And here are some of them. Can you recognize them? No. I need to be fair, I'm so cool guys, two ladies. They are all Jews, okay? The first one I think that, hey, let me know, you know what I mean? Let me know, Captain America and Avengers, okay? Scarlett Johansson, she is a Jew, okay? Next one, what, oh, this one you should know. You should use his uh, account, right? You know, using his application. Facebook, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg. He is the founder of Facebook, okay? So very powerful guy, one of the most powerful guys in the world today, huh? And this lady, wow, she flew the galaxy, you know? Queen Amidala, Star Wars. Okay? Natalie Portman. She's also a Jew, okay? And this guy, you should know, huh? This crazy guy. You, you know, right? Albert, uh, Albert Einstein, okay? So, because of all these famous people, people think, wow, Jews, huh? You control the internet. In fact, the, the founder of Google, Sergey Brin, founder of Google, also a Jew. He's also a Jew. What? You control Google, you control Facebook, you control the galaxy, you control uh, uh, the Avengers, what? Wow, you control the world. <laughs> so there is a misconception, which is not true, huh? not true. Okay? So a lot of people, actually, a lot of people are jealous of the Jews. They were jealous, they have years, but Jews accomplished so much. That's why they wanted to exterminate them. And this culminated in an event called the Holocaust in, during World War II. During World War II, the Nazis, 
that by Hitler exterminated 6 million Jews. Remember, there were 60 million, 6 million or wow, a third of the population. That was a very, very sad time. During the Holocaust, during World War II, from 1941 to 1945, the Nazis systematically killed Jews. Okay? Because they did not believe in the ideologies of Jews. The Jews say that everyone is equal. That's why they have the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill. But Adolf, Adolf Hitler thinks that no, not, not all humans are equal. I am descended from the Aryan civilization. I am superior. The German people are superior. And hence, Adolf Hitler started a campaign to destroy the Jews who believe in the equality of mankind. You look at this number here 11 men and women, including 6 million Jews, perished. That means for 5 million more. Those 5 million are what Hitler considered as subhumans. Subhumans. People who are handicapped. If you are handicapped at the time, Hitler said, no, you are subhuman, you die. So he killed a lot more people besides the Jews, but majority are the Jews. And today, this is what is happening. Remember, I said in 1948, the Jews finally had their own state to settle down. Remember, they are all over the world. In 1948, the United Nations came and said, okay, we give the Jews a home. That's why they call it Israel. At that time, the Palestinians were occupying their entire country. So, in a sense, they chased out the Palestinians. Huh? In 1946, look at Palestine territory. 1947, huge part became Israel. 1967, wow, Palestine level, Palestine level. And today, 2010, very few parts are left for the Palestinians. That's why today they're still fighting. Fighting and fighting, say, this is mine, this is my land, this is your land. To today, the conflict is still not resolved. It's very sad. Sorry, you have a question? Oh, okay, wow, well, your friend does not. He said, better just drop a nuclear bomb there. <laughs> you want to start World War II. Yeah. Okay, so that's not the solution, okay? The solution is negotiation. Huh? You have to come to the table to negotiate how we can settle this. Today we still not settle, so we try to pray that there will be peace in the Middle East, uh, in Israel. Okay, I want to spend five minutes on this picture. <laughs> what does this picture remind you of? Uh? Huh? Remember there was a parable? Okay, the reason why I show this is that I want to touch upon another aspect of Jewish culture is their language. language. Because this will help you to understand a lot of uh, Jesus' uh, parables. Remember he was saying once that it is harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to enter the eye of a needle. Very quantum, not very exaggerated. So in recent years, a lot of scholars, a lot of Bible scholars say that, oh, actually Jesus is not talking about the eye of a needle. He's talking about a small gate in Jerusalem. If you go to Jerusalem today, you find a small doorway where a camel, if fully loaded, cannot go into this doorway. The camel must unload all its um, riches and all the things it's carrying. Then the camel can go into this doorway that the Jews call the eye of the leader. Okay? If you hear this story from somebody, nicely tell them, not true. Okay? It's not true. When Jesus said this, he actually meant it. He meant it the eye of the needle. <laughs> okay, he really meant it. It's evidenced by another rabbi who is in, living in Babylonia. He also has a similar saying, a Jewish rabbi. He said that it's difficult for the elephant to enter the eye of the needle. Oh, even worse, the elephant. <laughs> but the reason why the rabbi in Babylonia said elephant is because in Babylonia at the time, the largest animal they've ever seen in that area is an elephant. So the largest animal Jesus has seen in his life is a camel. So he just camel up. Right. So Jewish language in the study, you realize that they like to use exaggerations. And they are called hyperbolies. Statical term hyperbole. An exaggeration to bring up a point. To bring up a point. Okay? So in this case, Jesus is saying that it's easier for a camel to enter the island, which is impossible. Then for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. 
To us, uh, to us, uh, if you don't understand the Jewish culture, we would think that, whoa, then I better don't be rich. Oh, I poor they go there. <laughs> rich cannot go. I like, poor. Okay. But actually that's not what Jesus meant. When Jesus said this statement, all the Jews in his time understood what he said. But when we hear it, uh, 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 also I must be poor. Uh, <laughs> you need to first understand Jewish culture. In Jewish culture, when you are rich, uh, like Abraham, it means that you are very blessed by God. So wealth is seen as a blessing from God. So to a Jew, a rich man is very blessed. A rich man is a good man, like King David, like King Solomon, like Abraham. So when Jesus said, it is harder for a rich man to enter heaven, they, they saw it as a man that is blessed by God, who is so good, also cannot go heaven. So I love you, cannot go heaven. Okay. So that is how the Jews understood it. And then Jesus said something else after that. But with God, nothing is impossible. Okay? Nothing is impossible. So he's telling the Jews, nobody can enter the kingdom of God except through me. Because I am God, nothing is impossible. So we need to understand the way the Jewish language is. Remember once Jesus also said something, if you want to be my disciple, you must hate your parents. Uh, he did say that, huh? Confirm, we read the Bible. He said, unless you hate your father, mother, wife, spouse, brother, sister, you cannot be my disciple. If you read it uh, without understanding Jewish language, you will say, huh, he's breaking the fourth commandment and honor thy parents. Which is not true. Why did Jesus say he must hate the parents? Simple answer is this. In the Jewish language, there is not a way to say more or less. They say, I love you, I love you more. I love him super more. You know? This more or less thing, uh, this language uh, is not available for use in the Jewish language. So when they say, if I love something lesser, I must hate it. For example, if you learn English, but you love maths more, you will say that, I love maths, but I hate English. That's how a Jew would say in the Hebrew language. I love maths, but I hate English. Actually, they love both, but they love maths more. Okay? So understand the Jewish comes, the language you understand that when Jesus said that, no, 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 go and hate your parents. Huh? It means that you must love God far more than your parents, than your spouse. Which is in, in line with the first commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Okay? Nothing else. So Jesus is not contradicting himself. Okay? So remember that. I think we do not have time now. Let's move on to the last part. So any questions? Huh? I hope you enjoyed this session and you understand a little bit more about Jewish people. Okay? If not, let's move on to the last part. Because we need to get ready for Mass at 11. Huh? I hope some of you will join me for Mass. We are all going for Mass at 11 o'clock. So even the parents not around, let them know you can join me for Mass at 11. I shall now pass the, the mic to Valerie and the person who did last year. Praise the Lordship. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.